Welcome to everyone to uh, the Massachusetts chapter of AFSP to our research connection. My name is Nancy Farrell. I'm a longtime uh, member of the Massachusetts Board of Directors and the National Board of Directors. And I'm pleased to um, introduce our guest today and to welcome you all to what I think is going to be a fascinating um, presentation and discussion. The Research Connection is, is a program that connects our advocates, uh, supporters, and donor, donors with researchers who have AFSP grants. The event meets several goals that we have. One is to hear from a leader in suicide prevention research in his own words, to have the chance for a conversation, and to understand the great value of the funds that you raise and donate. We like to tell people at our walks and every event how important it is um, to fund research, and today you'll understand one of the reasons why. You may not know that AFSP is the largest funder, private funder of, research, of suicide prevention research in the country. We know that the more we understand about suicide, the more we can prevent it. AFSP funded research is essential to our mission of saving lives and bringing hope to those affected by suicide. Our grants help to sponsor young investigators, engage senior researchers in suicide prevention, and foster new idea from suicide researchers at all levels to build a scientific community, which we so sorely need on this topic. This year, well, our current research portfolio has a value of approximately $22 million, which represents 100 ongoing studies and 37 new studies. There are two focus grants and 35 innovation grants for fiscal year 2022. Today's presenter, Professor Matt Knopf, is a recipient of the first focus grant that AFSB awarded in 2014. I was on the board of directors at the time at that meeting. We were so excited with this concept. We knew that we needed a different approach to how we were funding research and how to think about suicide prevention. The focus grant is open to innovative, potentially high yield proposals that focus on the risk of suicide. The goal is to examine and identify intervention strategies for short-term suicide risk that can be implemented in clinical settings. Professor Knox's research is aimed at understanding why people behave in ways that are harmful to themselves with an emphasis on suicide and forms of self-harm. His research is multidisciplinary and uses a range of approaches to better understand how these behaviors develop, how to predict them, and how to prevent their occurrence. Matthew Nock, PhD, is a professor of psychology and director of the Laboratory for Clinical and Developmental Research in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. Matt received his PhD in psychology from Yale University in 2003 and completed his clinical internship at Bellevue Hospital and the New York University Child Study Center. His work is funded by grants from the National Institutes of Health and several private foundations and it has been published in more than 100 scientific papers and book chapters. Matt's work has been recognized through the receipt of four early career awards from the American Psychological Association, the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, and the American Association of Suicidology. And in 2011, he was named a MacArthur Fellow. After Matt's presentation, we'll have time for questions and comments. Jess Vanderstadt, our Massachusetts Area Director, will moderate that part of the meeting. Personally, I want to thank you all for joining us today and hope that what you learn will um, increase, if needed, your, your presentation in our movement, but definitely prepare, help to prepare us all to learn more and to be better advocates. Um, with that, I want to say welcome, Matt. He does have a long history with AFSP, which I think he's going to share with us. Welcome. Great. Thanks so much, Nancy, for that uh... Intro wonderful introduction. Thank you to AFSP Massachusetts chapter for, for inviting me to present. And I do have a long history with AFSP and I'm, I'm especially honored to be here to present. Uh, I was telling Nancy uh, and, and others, my, my first job out of college back in 1995 was at the American, then called the American Suicide Foundation, now the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So the, the, when no one would give me a chance, AFSP did. And, and uh, it's been wonderful getting to work with AFSP over the years. Um, and now to, I'm re really honored to have our work funded by AFSP and excited to be here today to tell you about some of this work. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen to get started. So with the time that I have today, I'm gonna aim, I believe we have about an hour and a half. I'll aim to present for no more than about an hour. So I leave a lot of time for questions uh, and discussion. So at the time that I have, I'm gonna talk about how we can use new technologies to, to try to better understand, predict, and prevent suicidal behavior, focusing on short-term prediction, as, as Nancy mentioned, which is so important and, and right now it's really sorely needed. 
So as many, most of you know, this is a very, very complex problem that we're trying to understand. And it's something that we've been studying as humans for, for literally thousands of years. Virtually every major philosopher over the years has written about suicide, uh, giving us some really eloquent prose, but, but not respectfully a uh, much better understanding of why people take their own lives and hasn't really increased our ability to prevent it. So suicide remains a really big problem in our society. It's the 10th leading cause of all death in the US, the second leading cause of death among those ages 10 to 34 in the US behind only accidents. So it still takes many, many lives and is still uh, a major contributor to years of life lost given how uh, the high rates at, with which it strikes young people. And whereas advances in science and medical science and, and, and medical implementation have decreased the mortality rates for many leading causes of death over the past 100 years, cancer, tuberculosis, pneumonia, accidents, HIV, AIDS, more recently, uh, COVID, the suicide rate has remained largely unchanged. And the suicide rate now is virtually identical to what it was 100 years ago. So we haven't made the same kind of progress in this area, unfortunately. We have made some. So as many of my colleagues will point out, we've identified, and as I, as I will point out, we've, we've identified some key risk factors. We've identified some promising interventions, but I would argue that our progress has been slow and in many ways it's been stagnant and there's really a need to, to do a lot better than we have been doing. Some might argue with this perspective and say, no, things are fine. We're making great advances. Uh, as, as W. Edwards Deming has said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. And so we need data to, to help us answer questions like, are we getting better at, at predicting suicide? So this is a question that we asked um, recently, and this is, I'll, I'll show a few slides over the course of this presentation, uh, the results of this meta-analysis or a study of studies uh, that we did. This is work led by our former postdoc, Joe Franklin and team. Um, and what we did was look at every study we could find over the past 50 years and looked at how strong are our risk factors for suicide. So I'm gonna show on the vertical axis, our odds ratios, an odds ratio of one, for those who aren't familiar, means uh, there's no increase in risk given the presence of some factor, depression, anxiety, substance use. The greater the odds ratio, the greater the increase in your risk of suicide attempt or suicide death. So what we wondered here is, as we look across the past 50 years, is the strength of our, um, our, is the strength of our predictors getting higher and higher? So do these bars increase from left to right? And it turns out they don't. So we, we haven't been identifying stronger and stronger risk factors. If anything, it looks like maybe these bars are decreasing slightly. One might wonder why this is. If we look at what kinds of risk factors we've been looking at over the past 50 years, we see that we've effectively been, as suicide researchers, looking at the same risk factors over and over again. If you look at just this last table, we're looking at sociodemographics, things like person's age, uh, gender, race, ethnicity, and so on. Internalizing symptoms like depression, anxiety, externalizing symptoms, acting out behaviors, violence, substance use, conduct problems, prior self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, and negative life events. Those same five bins of risk factors are the top five for the past 50 years. They just change in order a little bit. And what we found is that in about 75 to 80% of all prediction cases, so all analyses that were done, about 75 to 80% of the time, we're looking at one of these five factors. And we've largely been doing this using the same methods, using largely self-report scales um, and interviews. And so perhaps then it's not surprising that if we're looking at the same predictors and using the same research methods, we shouldn't be surprised that we're getting the same results. And so I would argue, we, our research team would argue, that a new approach is needed or new approaches are needed. So what might those approaches be? There's a lot of different directions that one could take and that, and that we should take as, as researchers. What I'm gonna argue for today is the use of newer technologies, the incorporation of new technologies into our research and into our, our clinical practice and to our daily lives to try and get better at understanding, predicting and preventing suicidal behavior. Why focus on new technologies? Well, because they've made such dramatic changes in virtually every other aspect of our life. You think about um, how we solve complex mathematical problems. For a very, very long time, up until fairly recently, if we want to solve complex math problems, we used technology that looks like this. For those who are younger, this is an abacus. And now with advances in, in computing technology, we have supercomputers that have completely revolutionized the way that we live our lives, the way that not only we do math, but the way we do uh, business, education, entertainment, and so on. 
if we think about other domains, how is it that we travel from one place to another? We're here on Zoom today, which is another advance in technology. But for a really long time, if we want to travel to go meet with others, this was our most cutting edge technology. And now in the past few years, we have technology that transports us around the globe and most recently into space in ways that we never could before. And here too, this is changing the way that we live our lives. We interact, we trade, we educate, we, we entertain, uh, we, we care for our health and so on. Speaking of health, if we had a major health problem, um, 100 or so years ago, we lost a limb. This was our most cutting edge technology. And in the past few years, we now have robotic arms that are controlled by the human brain. Totally fascinating, uh, huge advances in our ability to help others. Now, if you move into the area of mental health, suicide, understanding, prediction, prevention, for thousands of years, dating back to at least the Greek, Greek sophists, if not earlier, we understood people's melancholia, uh, their, 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 and we tried to treat it using approaches that look like this. And now we, of course, have approaches that still look largely like this. What we would argue is that the time is now right for the convergence between the study and treatment of what is, it, what is admittedly a really complex problem, the problem of suicide, with advances in technology and computing that can help us try and uh, change the way that we understand, predict, and prevent. The question is, well, what, what might this look like? And that's what I want to talk about today. And what I'm going to argue is not that uh, we should use new technology because new technology is cool and interesting and available, uh, and we should use whatever we can get our hands on, but instead, we should be smart about it, and we should identify gaps in our current understanding, and then try and use new tools, new ways of thinking, new approaches to try and bridge those gaps in ways that we weren't able to do so before. So I'm going to focus with the time that I have today on three key gaps. The first is the need for methods for better combining information about known risk factors. As I mentioned earlier, we have identified key risk factors. We just haven't really known how to put them together. I'll say a lot more about that. We also need better objective data about suicidal thoughts. As I mentioned, we've been relying on people's own self-report, on interviews. These have limitations, as I'll talk about, and, and we, we need to overcome them as best we can. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about trying to better understand, as Nancy alluded to, as I think the title mentions, short-term risk or imminent risk. How do we better understand um, and intervene with people who are at risk right now? So I'll spend maybe 10 minutes talking about um, each of these each of these topics and then conclude and, and open it up for questions and discussion. So in terms of combining information about known risk factors, we have identified risk factors for suicide over the past now 100 years. Uh, and from our meta-analysis, these are some key risk factors for, some, these are the strongest risk factors for suicide death. Here too, I'm showing odds ratios. So an odds ratio of one means no effect. The higher the odds ratio, the bigger the increase in the odds, roughly risk of the outcome here at suicide death. So if you look at this first bar, this means that having a history of getting treatment nearly triples your odds of dying by suicide. Presumably not because treatment is harming people, but because the most clinically severe people are finding their ways into treatment. What I wanna highlight is that after that, all of the next bars have odds ratios of around 1.5. That means each one slightly ticks up your risk of, of dying by suicide meaning there's no one risk factor here. There's no one cause of suicide. There's no one factor that really dramatically increases your odds of, of dying by suicide. Suicide results from the combination of many different factors. Unfortunately, if we look at our meta-analysis of what the past 50 years of research has showed us, one of the things it showed us is that literally 99% of all studies that have been done look at one risk factor at a time. So we as researchers really haven't provided clinicians with a way of combining information about risk factors. So we need better ways of doing this. And so this has been one of the main focuses of, of suicide research over the past few years. Uh, a key study I wanna highlight is one done by my uh, colleague, Ron Kessler, who's uh, a researcher at Harvard Medical School. And in this study, what we did was try and improve our ability to predict which patients, which patients are going to die by suicide within the year after their hospitalization. It's, it's now very well known that this, the rate of suicide death, unfortunately, increases dramatically in the weeks following discharge from a psychiatric hospitalization. Someone has thoughts of suicide, depre severe depression, bipolar disorder, whatever the case is, requiring uh, or leading to a hospitalization. They receive treatment. Clinicians think everything is going better. The person can leave the hospital that post-discharge period is a really high-risk time for suicide death, lasting up to a year after hospitalization. 
but we don't know why, and we don't know which patients are at highest risk. What we wondered is, nowadays, data aren't kept in, in many healthcare systems on paper and pencil, they're stored digitally, they're stored electronically, and they sit dormant lying in a server somewhere. We wondered, can we use uh, machine learning methods, statistical learning methods to go in and look at those data, look at those coded medical record data to build algorithms that tell us whether a patient's going to die by suicide in the year after they leave the hospital. And we did this using a sample of six years worth of data uh, capturing over 50,000 hospitalizations. And this study was done among Army, US Army soldiers. And we, we focused on Army soldiers because the suicide rate among Army soldiers has increased dramatically in recent years. And so we're trying to better understand why. So in plain terms, what we did was take a sample of over 50,000 hospitalizations, go into those patients' electronic health records, build algorithms that predict using data only available from before that person set foot in the hospital, whether that patient is gonna make it, uh, wh whether they're gonna die by suicide in the year after they leave, with the idea that if, if we're successful, we can start giving this information to clinicians during the hospitalization so they can uh, use that to inform their clinical decision-making. So what happens is every hospitalization gets a predicted probability of this person dying by suicide in the next year. And we put those predicted probabilities into percentile bins, into 20 different bins of 5% each. So this first bin here on this horizontal axis, the number one represents the top 5% of risk scores, the number two, the next 5% of risk scores, and so on. And on the vertical axis is what percent of suicide deaths occurred in each bin. What we hope is that the suicide deaths uh, occur mostly in the high risk bins, meaning we can identify um, among whom they were going to occur. And that's in fact what we see. In fact, about half, slightly more than half of all suicides happened in that high risk group, in that first bin. Whereas the suicide rate in the army is shown here, 18 per 100,000 people. In this group, it's 3,800 per 100,000. So much, much higher death rate, suicide rate in this group uh, than more generally. What you might note though, is that this is about 4,000 per 100,000 or about four per 100 meaning four people out of every hundred in this first bar, in this first bin, died by suicide. That means 96 did not. So that's what we call a false positive. We, we put a person in a high-risk bin, but they didn't have the outcome of interest. So it's good that we can accumulate a lot of these suicide deaths in this top bin, but uh, a drawback is most people in this bin um, will appear to be at really high risk for suicide, but won't die by suicide. And that's a point I'll come back to in a moment. Interestingly, however, about half of people in this top bin had an adverse outcome in the next year. If they didn't die by suicide, they died by accident, or they made a suicide attempt, or they were re-hospitalized, suggesting that actually these data are actionable. A person in this bin has about a 50% chance of having a negative outcome, even if it's not suicide, suggesting these are folks that we should perhaps um, offer extra clinical care. One thing to highlight is this gives us pretty good predictive accuracy, better than we've had before. And this is done with data lying dormant in a person's medical and administrative data. This approach didn't require asking the patient or the clinician a single piece of information. We did this in the Army. The question is, does it replicate in civilian samples? It does. Uh, the citation I just showed is for a study done with colleagues, um, Jordan Smoller at Mass General Hospital, Ben Rice at Boston Children's Hospital and their teams. We showed that looking at about 2 million patients in the Harvard healthcare system, we could similarly identify a high-risk group with a similar similar level of accuracy. And most recently, we've shown that this approach replicates in five different healthcare systems around the country. So we take this approach, we send it to five other healthcare systems with a, several million patients overall, and we show that we can uh, export this to other healthcare systems and get similar predictive accuracy, suggesting this can help us gain traction in helping clinicians to better identify which patients are at high risk for suicide so that they can better intervene. I also wanna share some new results. Uh, Nancy alluded to our uh, receipt of the first AFSP focus grant, which we're really excited about. Um, it, and we now have results from the study that are under review for publication, but I'm excited to share some preview of, with them, of them with you here today. So what we wondered is, what I just showed is we can identify people at high risk using machine learning applied to patients' electronic health record. What if we also though ask patients questions about their, their risk and ask clinicians about patients' risk. Does combining all of these sources of data give us better predictive accuracy? And so we did this 
with a large sample of patients presenting to an emergency department. We, here we focused on the ED because about 40% of patients who die by suicide visit an ED in the year before they death. So this is a high risk population and this is a high risk time period. So we enrolled in the study 2000 patients passing through the psychiatric emergency department at Mass General Hospital, a local, a local Harvard teaching hospital with a psychiatric complaint. We applied machine learning to their electronic health record. We had them complete a brief iPad-based self-report survey about some known risk factors. We also asked their clinician about this patient's probability of making a suicide attempt over the next one month and six months. I'm gonna focus on one month data here to see how well do these sources of data do at predicting whether a person's gonna make a suicide attempt in the next month. So we can, again, with better identification, provide better, um, more, more targeted treatment. What we found, for better or worse, was that clinicians, unfortunately, I, I'm a clinician myself, were not much better than chance at predicting which patients are going to make a suicide attempt and which ones aren't. I'm showing, what I'm gonna show is, in a series of these slides is area under the curve. Uh, those who know what that means will be familiar. For those who don't, this essentially tells us um, the likelihood that we're making an accurate prediction. So 50%, an AUC of 0.5, means we're no more accurate than coin toss. The higher, closer to one we are, the more accurate we are. And what this literally means is if we're presented with two patients, one with a negative outcome, the adverse outcome, one without, what's the likelihood that we're going to get it correct in terms of which one's at higher risk? 50%, again, is, is no different than chance. Clinicians are, are around 67%, so slightly better than chance, though not so much so. Using machine learning on electronic health records improves prediction further. And our best predictive model was combining machine learning with patient self-report data while in the emergency department. And I mentioned in the last slide that with our, our machine learning model, uh, we have about 4% of people who we say are gonna make an attempt or die by suicide actually do so with 96% false positives. With this model, that 4% gets bumped up to about 30%. So about 30, about one in three of those who we say are at risk are gonna make a suicide attempt in the next, or go on to make a suicide attempt in the next month, a number that we think is much more clinically actionable. So actionable that we're now Oh, sorry, I, one other thing to mention um, in terms of clinical implementation, we also learned uh, that we can develop, we have developed a really brief self-report battery. The one that we tested um, shown in the middle of the slide had about 70 items in it. With only about 20 self-report items, so a version takes only four minutes, we can create a scale, we've created a scale that performs as well as the full model. Um, suggesting that with just a quick iPad-based assessment in the emergency department, we can provide clinicians with much more accurate information about which, patient, which of their patients are likely to make a suicide attempt in the next month. So they can incorporate that into their clinical decision-making and hopefully make more accurate decisions about which patients are gonna make a suicide attempt and so might benefit from hospitalization and which ones have a very low likelihood of doing so and so might be able to um, receive treatment in an outpatient setting, a less restrictive setting. And so we're now beginning to implement this clinically at local hospitals, a project, an extension of this project that we're really, really excited about. I wanna transition now to talk about the need for objective markers of suicide risk. So a lot of the methods, you know, the, the, the self-report battery a lot that I just mentioned um, via iPad in the emergency room, a lot of the methods that we use to know if a person's at risk for suicide rely on a person telling us that they're at risk. So if we wanna know if someone's thinking about suicide or intends to die by suicide, we ask them. We should ask them uh, because data have shown over the past few decades, about two thirds of people who die by suicide told someone they were thinking about death or suicide before they died. So if someone talks about suicide, talks about wanting to die, we should take that seriously. However, relying only on people's self-report of suicide can be problematic for a number of reasons. One, people have a motivation to deny or conceal thoughts of suicide for fear of being intervened upon or hospitalized against their wishes. We also know from work that I'll describe in a moment that suicidal thoughts are often transient in nature. They may be present now, uh, but, but absent a few hours, minutes, uh, days from now, and vice versa. They could be absent now and, and appear later. So, so simply asking a person at any point in time um, has its limitations. And we've learned from decades of research that many of us, all of us, lack conscious awareness of many of the factors that, that influence our behavior. So we're not good predictors of uh, what we're going to do day to day. We know these are our problems. Um, I mentioned that 66% of people who die by suicide told someone ahead of time. On the flip side, 
78% of people who die by suicide explicitly deny suicidal thoughts in their last communication before dying. And maybe this, this pattern is familiar to, to many of you where a person might talk about suicide and wanting to be dead and, and to die by suicide, sadly, one moment. And in their next interaction, they say, no, no, those thoughts, I no longer have those thoughts. I'm okay. I'm no longer at risk. So we have this increase in decreasing pattern. It's hard to know um, what the right course of action is in any given case. And it, it, it's especially hard, I think, to rely solely on a person's self-report for these reasons. So what's needed here is methods of assessing suicide risk that don't just rely on a person's self-report. So for instance, we might have a person in front of us, patient, friend, family member, colleague, who's saying, I don't want to kill myself. What we wonder, we might wonder though, is um, what might this person be thinking about suicide that they might not be telling us? What are their unspoken thoughts or their implicit cognitions, as we call them? So implicit cognitions are those, the, the mental content we have, mental associations we hold that don't rely on um, introspection and explicit self-reporting. And these are things we want to know about people for thousands of years, right? What, what, what might this person next to me be thinking about me, about themselves, about other people, about life or death? Fortunately, in the past few decades, social and cognitive psychologists have developed ways of measure, measuring implicit cognition that don't rely on self-report, but that instead rely on a person's reaction time or memory. One really nice test of, uh, of implicit cognition is the implicit association test or IAT, which is a test that's been developed by uh, Tony Greenwald and Mazarin Banaji and Brian Nostick and others researchers at University of Washington, Harvard University, University of Virginia respectively. And what the IAT or implicit association test is, is a brief reaction time test that shows you stimuli appearing in the center of the screen and asks you to classify them on the left and right of the screen and uses the speed with which you make these classifications to measure the associations you hold about these constructs. So for instance, I'm gonna ask you to ignore this screen for a moment. Uh, let's say we want to do a test of uh, basketball players and jockeys, and we wanna know if how you associate those things as being tall or short. And so we might do a task where we say, okay, we're gonna put basketball players and tall words on the right of your screen, jockeys and short words on the left of your screen. And you'll see appear in the center of the screen, basketball or jockey or tall and short related stimuli, words, pictures, and ask you to classify them. If basketball and tall are paired together and jockey and short are paired together, you're gonna to make those classifications really quickly. If we change the order or change the pairings and now pair basketball with short and jockey with tall and ask you to make those same classifications, you're gonna be much, much slower. The reason is we all associate basketball players with being tall, jockeys with being short. If we flip that around, it's much harder for us to, to make those classifications. The punchline being, we as humans are much faster classifying things that we associate as being like each other. What I wanna show you are data where we try to use that same logic and the same test to measure how people think about life and death. So we use the same structure and instead of basketball player and, and, and jockey, we use the concepts of life and death. And instead of tall or short, we use the, the concepts or attributes of, is this like me or not like me? And so the way this test works, this is a suicide implicit association test, is a person presented with a computer screen that looks like this, and then they see words appear in the center of the screen. Those words have to do with death, things like dead, dying, suicide, or life, living, thriving, breathing. They're me-related words, I, me, mine, or not me-related words, they, them, theirs. And if you see a, suicide, uh, sorry, a death or a me word, you hit a key on the left side of your keyboard, if you see a life or a not me word, you hit a key on the right side of your keyboard. All we're asking you to do is to correctly classify the words that appear in the middle of the screen. Based on the logic I described earlier, what we expect is that if someone's thinking about suicide, they'll be faster responding when death and me are paired together. If someone's not thinking of suicide, they're identifying with life, they'll be faster when um, life and me are paired together. And so I'll ask you to, to, to play along, if you will, at home, and just say out loud or think to yourself where the word in the middle of the screen should be classified. Should it be classified on the left or on the right? So suicide is a death-related word, so that would go on the left. And what we ask people to do is respond as quickly as you can without making any mistakes, and then we go on to the next stimulus.
and we measure your response time in milliseconds. So this will go on the left because it's a me related word. Right? 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 Left? 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 Okay, so we measure your response time when death and me are paired. And then we flip it for, so we do 30 trials of the first type, 30 trials of the second type. Now life and me are paired. Left, left, right, right, and so on. What we expect is that people who, who um, don't think about death, don't want to die by suicide, will be faster when life and me are paired. Those who are suicidal, faster when death and me are paired. Left, left, and so on. We administered this uh, implicit association test in a local emergency room and found that, interestingly, people who identify with life, so people who are faster when life and me are paired, about 10% went on to make a suicide attempt um, during our follow-up period after an ED visit. The rate of suicide attempt in those who are faster when life and me are paired, sorry, when death and me are paired was tripled. So those who made a suicide attempt had much faster responding when death and me were paired together. And in fact, performance on this test improved prediction of who made a suicide attempt above and beyond commonly used risk factors like chart diagnosis of say depression, clinician prediction, patient prediction, uh, the Beck scale for suicide ideation, a commonly used measure of severity of suicidal thinking with pretty good sensitivity and specificity, meaning we, we had pretty good um, capture, pretty good identification of those who um, went on to make a suicide attempt and correct classification of those who didn't. And these results, we should always look for replication of results in science. Results from any one sample might um, have some error in them, might represent a false positive. Uh, this study was replicated by colleagues in Canada shortly after we did it with really similar um, predictive uh, metrics suggesting these findings are robust. We also though want to see whether these effects replicate more generally in the population. So we've been part of a team creating a, a website where anyone can go take implicit association tests. You can go now, I although I hope you'll wait until the end of this, this presentation to Project Implicit Health, where you can register or you can click on take a demo test and you can take the suicide implicit association test or self-injury implicit association test or runs about depression, anxiety, eating, alcohol, drug use, and so on. It's a public education website about implicit cognition um, and also seconds as a, as a research site. We don't collect any identifying information. All, 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 all tests are anonymous. We put some of, the, some of our suicide self-injury tests up there and took a look at some of the data. And what we see is these effects are indeed robust and appear in the, in the general population. These are data on the suicide IET from 6,000 people that we randomly split into 3,000 and 3,000, ran analyses in half, replicated them in the other half. All of the effects replicate very nicely. We see that people who have made a recent suicide attempt have higher IET scores than those who didn't. Notably, all of these scores are in the negative direction, meaning in the general population, people tend to identify more with life. So life and me being paired very quickly gives you a, a negative score. Death and me very, being paired more quickly gives you a positive score. In the general population, virtually all of us are faster responding when death and me, sorry, when life and me are paired, but that life equals me association is weakened in people who are, who have made a recent suicide attempt. And interestingly, the more recent your attempt, the weaker the score, the more death equals me, suggesting that these scores probably ebb and flow over time as people thinking about suicide changes. What's nice also is that these tests now can be delivered on any computer, any smartphone, um, you can take them on an iPad, on a, on, a, on a smartphone, on any computer. So we can measure implicit cognition in many, many settings and repeatedly over time. These effects also, uh, what I showed you are all from adults. These tests have been used with adolescents and some really nice work by uh, my colleague, Cassie Glenn at Old Dominion University, who has shown that um, performance on this test can prospectively, going forward into time, predict suicidal ideation, suicidal thinking in Adolescents seen in psychiatric settings, adolescents seen in the community. This is adolescents in um, middle schools. Similar studies have been done in high school students. So this, this test could be used as part of screening. And in some really nice work by my colleague, Christine Cha, who's at Columbia University, she sh Christine has shown that uh, there's no iatrogenic or no harmful effects uh, over multiple studies to administering 
the the implicit association test of showing images, sorry, words related to suicide, images related to self-injury, cutting, burning, and the like, repeatedly showing people death-related words, death-related images, injury-related images does not significantly increase distress. It doesn't increase people's um, suicidal thinking or self-injurious urges. These are safe tests to use. And Christine also found, interestingly, that when people are in a negative mood, this test gets even more predictive. So what these bars show is the, the lighter bars are uh, scores for those with no history of suicide ideation or suicidal thinking. The darker bars are for those with a history. And we see the difference here is huge after a negative mood induction. So when a person is down, when a person is sad, how much are they thinking about suicide? How much are they identifying with death or suicide seems to be the important predictor. Uh, my colleague Alex Milner, who's at Franciscan Children's Hospital in Brighton, as well as Harvard University, uh, has developed and, 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 and um, made available a brief version of the IAT that takes only about 90 seconds to administer, so really useful uh, in, in clinical settings or in, in school settings or, or more generally. And again, all of these can be delivered um, anywhere, anytime on, on, a, on a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone. Which brings me to the final thing I want to talk about, which is uh, the need for better data on a person's imminent risk. Plainly stated, what we really want to know uh, as, as clinicians, as friends, as family, family members, is to what extent might a person be thinking about or at risk for suicide now? Is this patient, is this person in front of me going to try and uh, going to think about suicide or try and kill themselves in the next minutes, hours, days? What we wonder, though, is what, what does research tell us about short-term prediction? To answer this, we look back to our meta-analysis of, again, what studies, what, what have studies told us over the past 50 years? And when we look at all the studies over the past 50 years and calculate how much time has passed in these studies from when an assessment was done until a suicidal outcome was predicted. And it turns out, if we start at, at 12 o'clock and go around counterclockwise, roughly, it says 27%, roughly 25% of studies try and predict suicidal outcomes over 10 years or more, about another 25% over five to 10 years, roughly another 20, 30%, one to five years, and about 20% uh, between one month and one year. It's nice if you can predict what's gonna happen 10 years into the future, but it's not so useful clinically. What's useful clinically is who's going to make in a suicide attempt, die by suicide in the next, what would you say? Let's say next 30 days. What percentage of studies have tried to predict suicide-related outcomes over a 30-day period, 30 days or less? Turns out it's one-tenth of 1% 1 of all studies, meaning literally 99.9% .9 of all the studies that researchers have done have looked at prediction over one month or more into the future. Information that, while helpful, is not maximally helpful for, for those trying to intervene clinically or, or monitor a patient for safety. So what we really need is studies done on the natural unfolding of suicidal thoughts and behaviors as they occur in real life. Uh, we've lacked this uh, in defense of suicide researchers, if I may. Uh, this is hard to study. It's hard to study um, how suicidal thoughts unfold naturally. We haven't really had the tools to do so. So what researchers have done is bring people into the lab who have, have, who have had a history of suicidal thinking or behavior and study their, their characteristics right now using brain imaging or genetic testing or psychological testing and so on. Uh, this has been the best we've had, but it, it's really, I think, limited our progress. And it's a departure from the way science is done in virtually every other area. We have huge advances in our understanding of astronomy, chemistry, biology, um, ecology, and so on, by identifying some construct, some, 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 something in nature of interest, and carefully observing it, whether it's a movement of planets, of animals, of, of weather patterns, and so on. We simply haven't done that in the study of suicide because we haven't had the tools to do so, to go out into the world and observe people, observe this outcome as it, as it um, happens. And ethically, we're not able to bring people into the lab and elicit suicidal thoughts or behaviors. Fortunately, for better or worse, I, I think fortunately, um, we now are able to do this better than ever before because in the past five or 10 years, we've all effectively become cyborgs. We all now have these digital appendages that we walk around with that are constantly collecting data uh, of our language, of our texts, 
uh, of our voice, of our, of our schedule, of our, of our positive and negative thoughts, of our movement around, um, around the world. And this collection of data in real time, this continuous data collection, allows us to do what my colleague at Harvard Medical School, J.P. Onella, has called digital phenotyping, or the moment-by-moment -moment quantification of the person level, individual level phenotype in situ, in place, out in nature, using data from our personal digital devices. So the idea here is, can we capture information from smartphones, from wearable biosensors that will allow us to better understand people, that will allow us to capture fine-grained dynamic changes, fluctuations in some phenomenon of interest? So how do a person's thoughts, feelings, behaviors change during a depressive episode, a manic episode, uh, substance use cravings, during a suicidal episode when a person's thinking about suicide or transitioning uh, from suicidal thinking to suicidal acting. This method allows us to decrease the influence of recall bias. So asking people to report back in time about a period in their life when they were having thoughts about suicide, um, it's gonna have a lot of bias in it. Asking a person in real time what's happening is gonna give us a much more, much more accurate picture of what's leading to, what might be leading to their current state. This also allows us to observe processes um, that might predict behavior out in context. There's a uh, rich literature from across different fields showing that the way organisms operate in the laboratory is quite different for the interview room from how they operate out in the world. And this is undoubtedly true in the area of suicide understanding and prediction and prevention. And this approach will also allow us to test our theories about suicide using ecologically valid data. And it will allow us to collect never before available data to build new theories. Pick your favorite theory of suicide, uh, whether it's hopelessness theory or uh, Joyner's interpersonal model. These theories propose somewhat static constructs. People attempt suicide because they're hopeless. How hopeless? Over what period of time? How do we quantify that hopelessness? How might it ebb and flow? How might changes in hopelessness and interactions between hopelessness and other factors lead to suicidal thinking? And what other factors might interact to lead to suicide attempts? So there's a, likely a really complex chain of factors and chain of dynamic interactions that lead to suicide outcomes that we haven't been able to study by now, be, not being out in the world. These new approaches, smartphones, wearable biosensors, social media data, um, text data, email data will allow us to, to, to have better, better information about this. And ideally to do what I think of as a holy grail of, of, of this kind of work is to provide new opportunities to intervene before a person has suicidal thoughts or more feasibly before they transition to suicide attempt. Virtually all of the st studies that we have so far that have shown any degree of, of efficacy or effectiveness for decreasing suicidal behavior, dialectical behavior therapy, cognitive therapy, haven't shown an ability to decrease the risk of ever attempting suicide. They have some evidence for decreasing the risk of making a second or third or, or on and on suicide attempt among people who have already made an attempt. Given that uh, approximately half, more than half of people who die by suicide die on their first attempt, we need to do better at identifying people before they make um, suicide attempts, before they engage in suicidal behavior. So we actually did the first, I think the first ever study of real-time monitoring study of, of people who had suicidal thoughts using funding, with funding uh, from AFSP with a pilot grant that we got, I think in 2004 or five. And what we did, there, there were not smartphones, or at least not widely circulated at the time. So we gave people Palm Pilots and we had them carry them um, for two weeks. This is a sample of adolescents who had a history of engaging in non-suicidal self-injury, many of whom were having thoughts about suicide. We asked them to complete an assessment two times a day, at least, and they could complete an assessment whenever they had thoughts about self-injury or suicide. They uploaded these data every few days using their modem at home by putting it in a cradle. Things were different back then. We got these data every, every few days um, and analyzed them and, and um, got a better understanding of how suicidal thoughts and self-injurious thoughts tend to um, change over time. In related work, we had people wear this, um, in hindsight, somewhat cumbersome vest called a life shirt, which collected real-time physiological data. Whenever a person engaged in, in a self-injurious episode, they pushed a button that's on an adapter in their fanny pack. We could only get people to wear this for two days at a time because it was it's sort of like a gym penny with sensors that could stuck to your, your chest and your tummy under your clothes. And so very cumbersome. Uh, but this, this is our sort of first foray into this um, area, which would not have been possible without funding from AFSP 
And this early work has led to um, a huge amount of, of newer work capitalizing on the fact that at this point in the US, most people, most teenagers and adults, the vast majority have access to their own smartphones. And so rather than giving someone a Palm Pilot that they're not used to, uh, that's foreign to them, we can now pretty easily put apps on people's phones that monitor their suicidal thinking, that monitor related constructs or that assess related constructs like hopelessness, burdensomeness, belongingness, um, mood, anxiety, alcohol cravings, social isolation, and so on. And we can passively monitor data from people's phones and devices to, to augment our ability to understand, predict, and prevent. And so in an early study, what we did was put apps on people's phones that asked them questions about their suicidal thinking four to six times a day for one month. The questions looked just like this. So we asked people to rate on, on a short scale their desire to kill themselves right now, their intention to kill themselves, and their ability to resist the urge to kill themselves. And in our first foray, we want to just understand if we get a sample of people who say, I'm having serious thoughts of suicide, what do those thoughts look like? How much variability is there across people? How much variability is there within, within people? And so what I'm showing here, this is a study done by um, our colleague, Evan Kleiman, who is a professor at uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey. And these data are for approximately 50 participants. Each box is a different person. And on the horizontal axis, this is the passage of time over one month. And on the vertical axis, this is severity of suicidal thinking. So roughly just summing up the responses on those three items you saw previously. And what you might note is that there's a lot of variability across people, it would seem. And there's a lot of variability in most cases within people, a lot of ups and downs. So we tried to understand, might there be any patterns in these data? Because I'm a bit older than Evan, I asked him, hey, let's print these out. Let's print out paper copies and lay them on the floor of our research laboratory and look at them and see if we can switch them around and, and group them, cluster them into any different patterns that we might see. We didn't see any of these patterns. Um, Evan being much smarter than me said, let me do a latent profile analysis, which is analysis that will see whether there are any uh, latent or underlying profiles or clusters of, of types of suicidal thinking. What I'm gonna show is the same data rearranged and color coded. So the same box is just reorganized. What we saw was five different, um, what we might call subtypes of, of suicidal thinking that vary based on their mean or their level and their variability. So how, what, what, at what level of severity are they and how much do they ebb and flow? So these are all people who say, I've had severe thoughts of suicide recently. People shown in green had really low levels, lots of zeros with a few ones and twos. So pretty mild suicidal thinking by comparison. Those in yellow, low mean, but high variability. They had some peakier periods where they had some severe ideation. People in lavender, moderate mean, moderate variability. People in red, high mean, low variability. They virtually never came down to zero. People in blue, high mean, high variability. We wondered which ones, which, which participants were, were most likely to have recently made a suicide attempt. It's those shown in red, high mean suicidal thinking, never come down to zero. We replicated this in a second sample of psychiatric patients, ran the latent profile analysis, same five subtypes uh, emerged, suggesting this might be a, a stable way to think about subtypes of suicidal thinking. What we're doing now is longer term studies to try and better understand which of these patterns prospectively into the future predicts suicide attempt. Uh, do people move across these subtypes? Do people start in this green pattern, then move to yellow, purple, and then red? Um, do they move down and then back again? We just don't know from this one month um, couple of studies. So we're now following people for much longer periods of time and um, hopefully, we will, we'll be able to report back to you in the not too distant future with some results of that work. Some other recent work we've done, um, honing in on this hospital, hospitalization period, this is work um, led by one of our brilliant current graduate students, Shirley Wang, uh, as well as Daniel Coppersmith uh, and others. What we did was try and measure whether smartphone monitoring during the course of a psychiatric hospitalization, when a person is in a hospital for treatment for suicide risk, whether monitoring during that period can help us predict which patients are gonna make an attempt during that high risk post-hospital period. So whether someone makes a, a post-hospital 
suicide attempt. And what we did was collect data on suicidal thinking, the same questions asked four to six times a day during a hospitalization. And this is a sample of 83 adult inpatients. And what we tested is how well do we do making predictions about whether someone's gonna make a suicide attempt after they leave the hospital using a baseline battery, like the iPad battery I described earlier, a few self-report questions when a person comes into the hospital. What if we take all of their smartphone data from over the course of hospitalization and just average it, saying, what is this person's average level of suicidal thinking over the course of the hospitalization? Are they high, are they medium, are they low? And then the third thing we did was look at a dynamic model that looked at how much people's suicidal thinking changes from assessment period to assessment period, other rapid fluctuations and so on. And we compared those three. And what we found across metrics is when we compare the baseline model, the mean or average model, and the dynamic model, is that however we slice it, whatever accuracy metric we look at, the dynamic model outperforms the other two models. So looking at how much a person's suicidal thinking varies during hospitalization helps to improve predictive accuracy. And the runaway predictor in, in these models was probability of acute change in suicide ideation, meaning how much roughly, what's the probability of a big increase in suicidal thinking from one time point to the next? That, that dynamic change in suicidal thinking from one time to the next turned out to be a really strong predictor of suicide attempt. Another really strong one was data missingness. So people reporting suicidal thinking and then having a lot of missing data where they're not reporting their suicidal thinking. That lack of data was really predictive. I mean, it's an interesting finding across a number of different studies now that the absence of data among those who typically provide data who have been providing data is, is an indicator of suicide risk or, or risk of suicide attempt in this case. These are all still self-report data. We're in the process of analyzing passively collected data. So in the background, this is all done, of course, with people's informed consent. They, they know we're doing this. They know we're collecting these data and they know how and why we're using them and the ways we're using them. We're passively collecting through a few different apps, um, people's GPS data or their global positioning system. Where are they in the world? Accelerometer data telling us how much people are moving around. Their call and text data. At this point, not the content of their calls or texts. We're not listening in Big Brother style, but instead just looking at how much are people calling others, texting others, how much are they receiving calls and texts, and so on. And we're looking at Bluetooth signal to what extent are people, do they have proximity to others? So this is a, a sample of GPS data. Uh, we're using an app called BeWe that was developed by our colleague JP Onella at Harvard Medical School. And this is a, tr a trace from two different days for the same person. You can imagine this overlaying onto a Google map. Uh, the longer a person stays in place, the bigger a dot grows for that person. Blue is nighttime, red is daytime. So the person likely slept here, traveled to this place, went home, did a loop. They went, went for a walk at night. This is a different day. They didn't go very far from home. This is actually uh, one of JP's colleagues who went to work this day, went home and walked their dog. This is a weekend day. They didn't do much. They stayed close to home, highlighting the fact that in themselves, GPS data are not going to be very predictive of any, anything like um, suicidal behavior, but could be an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, a period of, of days like this might suggest behavioral activation, healthy engagement with others, whereas a, a period of pattern, a, a period, a pattern of days like this might suggest a uh, depressive episode, person not going out very much. Combined with other sources of data, maybe this helps us predict when a person is in a, a state where they might benefit from intervention. Uh, our graduate student, Daniel Coppersmith, has um, brilliantly been looking at how call and text data might predict suicidal thinking, perhaps not surprisingly. The amount that a person is texting with others is inversely associated with suicidal ideation. So the more connected, roughly, the more connected you are with others, the lower your likelihood of thinking about suicide. We're also collecting bio, wrist-worn biosensor data. This is work done collaboratively with our colleague Raz Picard at the MIT Media Lab. We're using the Empatica E4 device um, to measure people's electrodermal activity. So sweating on the skin, which is, can be a measure of uh, emotional arousal, heart rate variability, accelerometer, skin temperature. Each of these is collected differently. And a person pushes a button when they have thoughts of suicide, it marks the data. And then we're going through to, to measure to what extent do these data help us predict button presses, suicide, suicidal thinking episodes. And our colleague Simon Fedor is working on some analyses. These are AUCs testing to what extent do electrodermal activity predict, data predict button presses the, the next day. Remember AUC of 0.5 is no better than chance so that they don't help us very much. 
heart rate variability improves prediction. Accelerometer data with an AUC of 0.75 are our best predictor, roughly moving around a lot the night before. So if you're moving around a lot on Thursday evening, that predicts you having thoughts of suicide in our preliminary analyses on Friday. Perhaps a person, if a person's really agitated, uncomfortable, moving around a lot, uh, that's getting picked up by these bracelets predicting suicide ideation. Early uh, results, so we'll see how these hold up um, to replication. And this is work that's being supported by a grant from NIMH where we're collecting data from 300 adults and 300 adolescents over a six month post hospital period to better understand uh, people's risk during this period so that we can better identify high risk periods among this high risk sample and intervene in real time. Before I talk a little, a little bit about intervention and end, I wanted to just touch on what's happened or what we've observed happening with suicidal thoughts during this COVID pandemic. The study that I just mentioned where we're following 600 adolescents and adults um, during this pre-hospital period started before COVID and, uh, and so provided a natural opportunity to be observing people with suicidal thoughts before the pandemic hit, which allowed us to see what happened to suicidal thoughts um, as the pandemic unfolded. So we were already studying people presenting to an emergency department or inpatient unit with suicidal thoughts and following them for six months. The pandemic hit and we observed what happened to suicidal thinking during this time. I won't show you GPS data. What they show is that not surprisingly, uh, around mid-March when the pandemic was, when, when COVID was declared a national emergency, uh, GPS data showed that everyone was staying home virtually 24 hours a day. During the same period, uh, in our daily battery, we asked people about feelings of social isolation several times a day. Feelings of social isolation skyrocketed leading up to the, the COVID being declared a national emergency. Perhaps not surprisingly, suicidal thoughts also increased during this time early pandemic and increases in social, social isolation predicted increases in suicide ideation. And this is work led by uh, one of our brilliant researchers, Becky Fortgang, along with Shirley Wang, Daniel Coppersmith, Aja Reed Russell, Alex Milner and others. Interestingly, we see this pattern in adults, but we did not see the same pattern in adolescents. We don't yet understand fully why that is. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. It might be that adolescents um, are, are were less affected early on in the pandemic. They're staying home from school, which is not so bad for all adolescents. They're already naturally connected with their friends through social media, Snapchat, Discord, TikTok, so on, um, and might not have been as engaged with, the, with the, the, the early consequences of the pandemic as adults were. We've certainly seen this pattern change over time. And more recently, we've seen increases in hospitalization, ED visits uh, among adolescents. So these results, I can't highlight enough, are from very early first, first few months of the pandemic. So I want to end by talking a little, just very briefly about possibilities for interventions. So very often, um, if we find someone who's at risk for suicidal thoughts and behaviors, we refer them to crisis services if they're not already in treatment. Unfortunately, many people who are referred for services don't use them, only around 10 or 20% do. So one thing that researchers, that clinicians have done to try and increase people's use of such services is the use of what's called barrier reduction interventions. And simply, this is a brief intervention where we identify potential barriers to, 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 to getting help and try to remove those barriers to treatment. I actually did one of these for my dissertation research 15 plus years ago, where we did a randomized control trial of parents bringing their kids in for treatment. Um, I won't bore you with the details of my dissertation, but I will. the notable part, if anything, from that work is it took about two years to enroll 76 patients, participants into this study and we randomly assigned parents to get versus not get a brief intervention. And we found over this two plus years that getting this little intervention increased parents' engagement, attendance, uh, attendance at therapy. With advances in technology, we can do this much, much, much more efficiently using new technology. So I wanna highlight here a recent study done by uh, one of our brilliant recent PhD students, Adam Jaruszewski, uh, in collaboration with our colleague, Rob Morris. And here we screened about 40,000 people and found 1,500 who are Rob's machine learning model suggested were at risk for suicide. We randomly assigned those 1,500 to get versus not get a really brief barrier reduction intervention. And this whole test of this intervention took only five weeks to complete. 
This work was done with Rob Morris's um, company called Coco, which is a, you can think, think of it as a safety net for social networks. So it's a, a, uh, a platform and app running in the background on some social media platforms and text platforms that finds people believed to be at risk for suicide and intervenes often with, with chatbots. And so in this case, what we did was um, work with Coco to try and intervene with people determined to be at risk through their um, text chat. So these are screenshots from my own screen where I entered text suggesting that I was having thoughts of suicide. And so in gray is the app and in blue is me. It asks what country I'm in. I say I'm in the US and it refers me to one of several different crisis lines. And this is a common approach that's used online in apps and so on. If you find someone at risk, refer them to a crisis line. I click OK, thank you. It then asks me, so be honest, how likely are you to try the resource I just shared? If I say very likely, we're done. If I say not likely, now I'm randomly assigned to get versus not get some mini intervention. People randomly assigned to get the intervention get this. It's very short and sweet. Thanks for telling me this. We asked other people about some concerns they had about calling the crisis line. Pick one that speaks to you. I just want to chat. I can't use my phone right now. I don't want the police called. This is intense. I don't trust professionals. I don't want the police called as a common one. So I can, if I click on that, no police. I get a little blurb saying most calls to crisis centers don't end with the police or paramedics showing up. This is extremely, extremely rare, like less than 1% rare for many crisis lines. So you click OK. I can click on other potential barriers and it gives me a one or two sentence explanation of why this is, shouldn't be such a concern for me. Fully automated intervention, very short and to the point. What we found is that people who got this little mini intervention had a 23% increase in their use of crisis services in the next few hours. Wasn't 100%, but a 23% boost is, is significant, pretty big. And this is brief, it's fully automated, required, it was programmed by Coco and then required no human in the loop and it is fully scalable. So this can be launched on a really grand scale. I hi highlight this not to say this is the intervention to be used, but just to highlight the, the, the potential with this approach where we can test out iteratively interventions with people through their phones, through social media platforms, through um, many different digital platforms and iteratively, if we're smart about it, iteratively test which of these things are working, which ones aren't, and then scale up the ones that are working, uh, get rid of the ones that aren't to try and systematically improve our ability to reach out and help those at risk. So in conclusion, I think there's great opportunities for advance by using digital data, electronic health records, other data sources to improve our ability to predict by co combining information about risk factors using data that are lying um, dormant in many places. We now have objective measures. I show data from the IET. This is one of many potential objective computer-based measures that can help us improve the detection and prediction of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And we're getting better uh, and have the tools now to do better short-term prediction and intervention using mobile devices. So I think there's great opportunities for using digital means, uh, new approaches to computing and technology uh, to get better at, at not only understanding, but prediction and prevention. There's a few big challenges I didn't mention, but I'm happy to discuss some obvious ones. Um, how do we deliver these risk scores to clinicians and to patients? So if we're doing machine learning on health records and a person is identified as being at high risk for suicide, should we tell them? Should we tell their clinician? On one hand, of course we should. Why would we not intervene? On the other hand, what if we're getting a lot of false positives? Might there be some harm? to telling a clinician or telling a patient that they're at high risk for suicide when really they may not be. They may be one of the false positives, so to speak, from our model. So this is something that we have to, and there are other, other um, angles and issues to think through here. Um, as we augment these models and pull in sources of data, uh, should all of the data sources we pulled in be shared with the patient? Should they be shared with the clinician? Should they be shared with your provider? And so on. A lot to think about, a lot to work through there ethically. Which assessments, which interventions work best for which patients? This is something that gets referred to as heterogeneity of treatment effects. In short, each intervention doesn't work e equally well for each person we've learned. Some people might do better with uh, cognitive therapy, others might do better with medication A, others with digital um, intervention C. Answering questions about which intervention, which assessment works best for which person takes lots and lots of people. 
Now, uh, if we're recording a lot of these data, a lot of these uh, treatment choices electronically, we can start getting better at tailoring interventions to people. So based on your characteristics, this is the best, this is the preferred intervention for you. Uh, there's a lot of questions in there, but ones that we're starting to be able to tackle. Uh, and finally, another big one is what are the ethics of monitoring people through their smartphones? Uh, where does our responsibility for um, disclosing data, for intervening, start and stop? What about deploying implicit intervention? Um, if we can subtly tweak people's behavior in various ways to keep them safe, should we do that? Uh, on one hand, it might feel a little big brotherish to intervene without people's okay. On the other hand, this is happening to us all the time. If you're searching on Google or any other search engine, or if you're on social media platforms, you might notice if you I have several young children, I'll be searching for soccer cleats on Google, and then I'll go on Facebook and I'll see ads for soccer cleats and soccer balls and soccer goals and so on. So we're all being we're all being tracked if, if, if we're online um, and intervened upon to try and sell us things and so on. Um, should we use the same kind of approach for, for health purposes or not? We need to think more, I think, about how to work together across um, academic research, um, hospital and, and, and healthcare systems and industry to make sure that we're all in sync on how we are um, developing and deploying these, these tools to try and help people um, have uh, better life outcomes. I'm gonna end there um, by saying, first thing, thank you so much and, and, and acknowledging AFSP for all of their incredibly generous funding and support. Uh, these other sources of funding, the Fuss Family Research Fund, the Griswold Suicide Research Fund, NIMH, DOD, Army, Air Force, several other sources of funding not listed here. I also wanna give deep uh, shout out to our research lab, only some of whom are shown here. Um, and again, to AFSP for the, for the years of support and for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Thank you so much. And I look forward to any um, comments or questions that you might have. Well, thank you so much, Professor Nock. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. You know, oftentimes it's hard for, I didn't start by introducing myself. My name is Jessica. <laughs> I'm the area director for the Massachusetts chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, and as was just mentioned, it's oftentimes hard for AFSP staff and volunteers to really kind of explain why we invest so much money in research and how it's changing our field. So thank you for today's presentation. We have a number of questions um, that I'd love to address. And I do wanna acknowledge those individuals who are joining us on Facebook Live as well. Um, so thank you, whether you just came across the live stream or you missed registration, thank you for joining us. And I have a few questions from there as well. Um, to answer one to start with, so this presentation has been recorded and it will be posted on our chapter's YouTube page and also on Facebook, um, definitely by tomorrow morning, hopefully by the end of today. It takes a little while to export, but we'll get that posted as soon as possible. So I know one of the questions that came up and I will kind of group these together. There was a lot of kind of feedback regarding the alarming um, rates of military, specifically Army. So one of the questions that came up is, you know, pursuing the Army data includes a fairly diverse population, but leans more male. Is it correct to say that this gets balanced by using meta metadata? And also around that, what can we do to better support the military? Yes, so we certainly take into account that um, the arm, so the army is about 80% male, 20% um, female. And so the suicide rate is increasing. We've, we've looked at these data a number of different ways um, to, try and under, to try and understand um, this increase. Uh, early thinking was it was these never, seemingly never ending wars. And so people, with, our, army soldiers who have multiple deployments are at, are at elevated risk. Um, it turns out people have been deployed, suicide risk is increasing those who are previously deployed, those who are never deployed, suicide risk is increasing. Um, one thought was maybe it was people who are getting army waivers. Uh, there was a period where, people, where fewer people were joining the army, so army was giving waivers to those who, who maybe had a pre-existing uh, legal history or, or psychiatric history. There was an increase among those with waivers, but that doesn't explain the increase. There's also an increase in suicide death among those without waivers. So it was in males, it was in females, it was in deployed, it was never deployed. Um, we're still trying to get a, to get a, our, our, our um, heads around and get a good understanding of why the increase among, among army soldiers. Um, so it is using all different sources of data. So the data that I presented were from a study called Army STARS. STARS is an acronym. Um, study to assess, assess risk and resilience among service members. It, there's a, if you Google Army STARS, you'll see the website and it describes we're using metadata, we're using self-report data, we're using genetic data, 
many different sources of data to try and really understand what puts our soldiers at risk and when, so how can we better intervene? Um, in terms of what can be done to help support support the soldiers, support suicide research, what was I? I military, it was, it was asked military in general. I think support, so, you know, reach out to service members who might be in your life, reach out to veterans who might be in your life. Uh, one finding that sticks with me is when service members are asked who they go to for help, single digits go to their healthcare provider. High double digits, you know, around half, go to friends, family members, loved ones. So we know that service members, veterans, like many of us, are much more likely to reach out to those around them than the healthcare providers. So a lot of the data that I provided, a lot of the studies that I talked about, were about in healthcare settings. But we know, we know, and we know that about half of people who die by suicide visited a healthcare setting in the month before their death. So there's reason to focus there, but about half didn't. And so maybe reaching out to friends and family. So I think one easy thing to do, or maybe not always so easy, but one thing that one tangible um, local thing to do is to reach out to, to, to service members who you may know, veterans who you may know, spontaneously check in, how are you doing? What's happening? Be there, listen, um, break the ice on topics of mental health um, and on suicide. Talk about, talk about these things. Um, when you suspect they may be an issue, when you suspect they might not be an issue, um, to sort of normalize and decrease stigma about talking about mental health and talking about suicide. The same things that I would say to do among those uh, you know, outside of military. One thing that we found over and over again in, in Army STARS and in other studies of service members and veterans is a lot of the risk factors that we see among service members and veterans are the same risk factors that we see among um, non-service members and non-veterans. Suicide, you know, some universalities about suicide that we're still understanding um, that exist really generally. So I, I would recommend doing the same, not just with our service members and veterans, but, but more generally. We can't, can't say it enough, the, the importance of reaching out to others, talking about suicide, talking about mental health to try and decrease stigma and make it okay to have these conversations. Absolutely. And I'll post some resources that AFSP has in regards to having what we consider a real convo around suicide and mental health. Sure. So this was a really interesting one. I'm looking forward to this, your answer. But with the use of smartphone control software like Bark, Circle, NetNanny, um, which mm -hmm. can decode the emojis and internet slang to alert parents, caregivers to suicidal ideation. How do you feel around those? How do I do what? Feel around those? How, how, what is your feeling around those? Yes. Do they work? Are they effective? Uh, empirical questions, these. Uh, there's a lot of apps out there. I, I've, I, I've tried to use some of these and haven't had great success. So anecdotally, so I have some personal <laughs> anecdotes about how they... I can't get them to work. This could be my advancing age, not, not, not the apps. Maybe I'm just not understanding how they work. Uh, I think with apps, we really have to stay empirically minded. There's a lot, there's a, a, an explosion of mental health apps, of suicide related apps. Uh, one of our, our colleagues, Chelsea Wilkes, just published a review of um, suicide related apps that are out there. The punchline is there's a lot of mental health, there's tens of thousands of mental health apps that make great promises there's suicide related apps that make strong promises. I'm sure all of, most of them, all of these are very well-meaning. Very, very few have any evidence for their efficacy that they can improve symptoms of depression, decrease anxiety, uh, increase safety in those at risk for suicide. So I think I would encourage people to, 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 to try and become um, Inform consumers of these things. Look for data, look for evidence. Have any of these apps, do they have experimental data supporting their, their, their efficacy? What percentage of people who use them have, have positive outcomes? Um, have there been any trials done on these? It's the same way we do with, with vaccines, uh, with medications, with, with um, traditional interventions. We wanna test them out experimentally. Give them to some people, don't give them to others and see if the people who got them compared to those who didn't have better outcomes. We don't have that for a lot of these things. And so I'm, I'm always cautious with the claim, you know, a lot of big claims get made and there's no data to support them. Sometimes it's well-meeting, sometimes it's very financially motivated, but I think we have to keep, um, keep skeptical, uh, keep hopeful, but skeptical and be, and be empirically minded or scientifically minded about, about evidence in support of something. If we're gonna give it to our kids, uh, if we're gonna use it um, with our family members. Yeah, and, and you know, around that also, I would also mention the continued availability of apps. You know, there was a comment about My3, which is an app at the grassroots level we used quite a bit. And as of 
not really sure when it was discontinued, but we just recently found out that it is no longer available on the app store. So, you yeah. know, relying on these apps and not having them available becomes a huge challenge as well. Yeah, yeah, That's a good point. So a little bit about privacy issues. Um, do researchers encounter any privacy issues when trying to capture data from smartphones and devices? And how do you work around that? Yeah, I think it's a huge issue um, and a really, really important one that we are still figuring out. Um, there's a huge range in the kind of data that get captured. I mentioned, you know, in the study that we're doing now, we're getting call and text metadata. So we're not looking at the content of calls or texts because to me that seems, I don't say overly invasive, but another level of, in, of invasiveness. If you want to know who, you know, if you want to pull out hashed numbers, meaning you're going to create a code for the, for the phone numbers in my phone, so you'll never know who I'm actually calling or the, in the data that you work with, you're not looking at who I'm calling. And you're just looking at, did I text them? Did they text back? How many characters did I text? How many characters did, did they text back? That's fine. If you want to look at the content of what I'm saying to my friends and what they're saying back to me, that gets to be a little bit trickier. And those, you know, there's some privacy, there's some confidentiality issues. Those data have to be handled with much more, much more care and sensitivity. Same with GPS data. Once you have a GPS signal on someone, they're identified. You know where, if you know where they're sleeping every night, depending on what part of the country it is, if it's an apartment building, it gets more complex, but if it's a home, you know who that person is. A lot of the data we're collecting are among adolescents. So if we're collecting data from suicidal adolescents and we have a GPS signal on their phone, we treat those extremely sensitively. We don't, I'm not willing to share those with anybody. Um, I don't want to share them with respectfully with NIH or with anyone, because I think we, it's our responsibility to control those data and make sure that that person's identity is not made publicly available for people to dig into. We'll extract features from those data to say, how many hours did this person leave the day? How far did they go? But we never want that person to be identified. So I think it's incumbent upon the researcher to, to treat the data uh, as sensitively as the data are. And if they're identifying to, to, to make sure that those, that, that identity doesn't get broken, um, unless the, the, the person making the data available knows um, how their data are going to be used. And there's some apps that are being used that um, capture, you know, screen capture repeatedly what's happening on your phone. Uh, much more sensitive. There, I think it's just really important that the participant, the person using the app, knows exactly what's being captured from their phone and exactly how it's going to be used. But these are, I think they're, they're, they're really tricky issues that not just us, but I think I've talked to colleagues in, in industry, social media, um, um, healthcare companies, how, you know, as we get more and more personal information from people, we have to make sure we treat it as sensitively and as safely as possible. And as we get, you know, as data change and as data security changes, we've got to keep up with the times uh, and make sure that we're, we're staying ahead of things on it. Yeah, I think talking about this, there were quite a few comments, questions about keeping adolescents safe on social media, um, mm -hmm. but also, you know, protecting their privacy. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any comments or feedback about how particularly caregivers, parents can keep um, adolescents safe? Yeah, I do. Um, there's a, 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 I'm biased. I was a part of the study, but it wasn't me driving it. Emily Weinstein um, and Evan Kleiman and, and other, uh, Pete Franz, other smart groups did this really wonderful recent qualitative study where they, in, in, I think the paper is available from our web, on our website, they interviewed uh, adolescents and parents uh, in, in instances where adolescents were psychiatric inpatients about smartphone use and social media use. And this interesting thing can happen with hospitalization where kids are on social media repeatedly and then during a hospitalization, they often have their social media, their phone taken from them. And there's a little bit of a anxiety, stress, freak out that happens. And then kids often experience some, some calm, um, not having social media, not having a smartphone. And then there's this sort of anticipatory period of getting it back again. And how do we interact with others about it? What we learned in this process was, and I'd encourage you to check out the paper, is what, what we think might be helpful is sort of social media hygiene, to use a sort of maybe dated term, people used to talk about mental hygiene and you know, sort of knowing how to take care of yourself and, and, and um, engage in well-being. I think it's important for parents to talk with kids about how they're using their phone and have some good sense of how kids are using their phone and be part of that uh, experience and part of the conversation. And I'm not naive. I have teenagers and know that, yeah, they're not going to sit down and show me everything in their phone. I know. Um, but being able to have conversations like you might with what's happening with your friends, what's happening with your siblings, what's happening with your with those who, who you're talking with, having some familiarity with what they're doing on their phone and helping to sort of guide them as best you can with how to have healthy, appropriate um, relationships is really important. One thing that we learned is 
almost to the one. Kids are benefiting from phone use, from social media use, at least the kids that we talk with. There's lots of positives in terms of staying connected with others, psychoeducation, making friends online. There are some, some costs as well, some, some negative aspects, some things that maybe um, lead to unhealthier behaviors as there is with anything with the internet, with, with, you know, with, with apps, with, with face-to-face -face communication. I think it's important to do what we, what we know works in real life, which is to talk with the kids, be there with them, um, help, to, help them navigate the situation, the, the, the use of, the, of these technologies. And with that, you know, you talked about talking and so there's a question about um, triaging for specifically 13 to 24 year olds and how effective are exiting or existing surveys, sorry, um, like signs of suicide. For prevention purposes? I mean, it didn't say specifically, but it looks like some of okay. their questions are related um, to more of like um, clinical care. Um, so for 13 to 24 year olds, I mean, I'll speak broadly because I don't, I, don't, I don't fully understand the, I'll, I'll speak about it all because I don't understand exactly what, what, what's being asked about. Um, screening, there's you know, screening for suicide programs that ask kids, um, about suicidal thinking, I think are really valuable. I know a lot of schools have booted them out because they don't want kids asked about suicide for fear that the surveys, getting, this, getting questions about suicide is gonna increase people's thoughts about suicide. There's very good data from, from Maddie Gould at Columbia uh, and others who have shown that asking people about suicide does not increase thoughts of suicide. It's not harmful to ask about suicide. I think that's, there's, there's value to that. I, think, I know a lot of schools don't wanna ask about suicide as well because if people say yes, if students say yes, there's then some requirement that schools take a step to act to try and, to try and um, do a follow-up assessment and perhaps push someone towards um, a, a more formal clinical evaluation. I think that should be done. Uh, we screen for lots of things. We should screen for, for, for thoughts of suicide. Do the screening programs in themselves or do edu psychoeducational programs about suicide themselves decrease suicide risk? I don't know. And I don't know that the data are, are, are there for that. I think that they, they intend to, all the data that I've seen suggests that psychoeducational programs, programs in high schools that teach kids and teach guidance counselors and teachers about suicide and self-injury, increase people's knowledge about those things, increase people's self-reports that they're likely to refer someone who they think is suicidal, but I don't know that they actually have downstream benefits at decreasing suicide death. I don't know that they don't, but we just don't have the data to my knowledge. In terms of interventions, uh, there are data for things like dialectical behavior therapy, uh, that, that show that, like with adults, DBT can decrease risk of suicide attempt in those at risk. So if I have a friend or family member who is an uh, adolescent, young adult, who I think is at high risk for suicide, self-injury, dialectical behavior therapy, cognitive behavior therapy are the frontline treatments that I always look toward. Uh, Does hospitalization work? is an interesting question and one that we're- That was actually every, one coming up. <laughs> okay, it's one that I, people have been puzzling over for years to, to the general point of, we now have big electronic data sources. There's now work being done to try and do a really nice job of matching people at similar levels of risk. Some who happen to get hospitalized, perhaps because they look close to a hospital, some who didn't, um, or some who just, all things being equal, this person got hospitalized, this one didn't. What's the effect of hospitalization? Um, those studies are being done. Early results that I've seen question whether, whether hospitalization has a strong impact. My guess though, is that as we, as we move forward, we're going to learn that hospitalization is helpful in some instances for some people with some, some profiles, but not others. Um, and that I think is the important thing is, is figuring out again to the question of heterogeneity of treatment effects, for whom is hospitalization at this time likely to be helpful? For whom is it likely to not be very helpful? For whom might it be actually harmful? So for a lot of these things, effects of interventions, I don't think it's gonna be a simple answer. It's gonna be, who is it helpful for? Who is it harmful for? And that's the, I think one of the most important questions ahead of us. And there was a comment, um, can you do another session just on the challenges of the future? <laughs> so there's a special request to come yeah. up, um, do another session. Um, and there I was- I sev several of those on the <laughs> Several. <laughs> yeah. Well, since we only have a couple minutes left, um, I do wanna let everyone know that I will pull um, the transcript from today, and we'll get answers to a lot of the, the smaller questions, you know, how to get involved with AFSP, where will the recording be, we'll make sure you get those answers. But in the last couple minutes together, there was quite a few questions, comments, just regarding about coming out of this pandemic and what that looks like. We know, or we've been reported, that suicide rates were pretty stable last year, but 
Are we seeing an increase now? What can, you know, how can we prepare ourselves as we move kind of out of this pandemic? Yeah, it's a great question. And I don't, I, I don't have the answer. I, and I would be skeptical of anybody who claimed to have the answer. Uh, this is an unusual time. I think for me, the, the key is um, remaining vigilant, meaning, you know, monitoring. Um, how are, how is each other doing? How are our kids doing? How are our family members doing? How are our, our, you know, our parents, our siblings, our friends, our, our children, our grandchildren, checking in with how people are doing and responding flexibly over time. Uh, this is new, terri for, new territory for everyone, healthcare professionals, schools, everyone in, in, in society. So I think just um, repeatedly checking in, course correcting, uh, and trying to stay connected as much as possible. I think there's some data to support this that I won't get into on what is the effective pieces of interventions we have. I think a lot of it, and there's data to support this, is the connectedness piece. It's, it's checking in with people and seeing how they're doing and being available and, and trying to decrease isolation. Call your friends, call your friends, call your, 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 your family members, talk to your children, stay connected with each other um, as we move out into the world. And also behavioral activation, I think is gonna be really important. Uh, a lot of us have been sedentary, have been in one place, have been in our homes for a really long time. There's really good data on behavioral activation for depression, for mood, for anxiety, um, for alcohol, for substance use. Aerobic exercise several times a week, data suggests is as effective as many antidepressants. Getting out and being active a few times a week, engaging in pleasurable activities, being out in nature, all of these things decrease depression, decrease anxiety, decrease alcohol substance use. So getting out, staying connected, I think is it's simple and it doesn't get prescribed because it's there's not money to be made from it, um, frankly, but it's it's really valuable, simple things that can be done. And that's, that's what I would propose. Yeah. That's interesting because it's many of the things we were saying, you know, back March, April of last year, as we went into the pandemic, now we're ha we need to have those same conversations of re reconnecting in a lot of yes. ways. Yes. Well, I appreciate all the time that you've given us today. This is a fantastic presentation. And again, it just goes to show why it's so important that we as an organization fund scientific research for suicide prevention. We look forward to, um, well, it sounds like you have a few requests. So maybe we'll have to do a, a follow-up <laughs> in a few months. <laughs> we'll yes, it. can I just add that... Yes. Um, I know how many people work with you, Matt, and um, on this side of the screen, how many of us care about what you do. So really, thank you very much. Um, I know it's your living, but for us, it's it's also about living. So it's real. It's so important. Same, and thank you. It's it's it, it is it, it is a profession, but it's become extremely personal over the years. Um, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to work with you all. And thank you to everyone who's who's listened in and who contributes to empathy and, and who works together on trying to, to, to turn the needle on this problem. So thank you. There was a question of how do I take one of your classes? I, th I think the answer would be you have to become a student in Harvard, correct? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, yes. Uh, or Harvard Extension School has classes. I occasionally teach there. And we have some, some members of our team teach classes in the Harvard Extension School, which is a, a easier thing to attend than uh, enrolling and waiting a year to see if you got into Harvard College. <laughs> Sounds good. But thank well, you. Again, if you have questions, please do, please do reach out. Um, we're here in Cambridge. We're online. I'd love to hear from folks. Thank you again. Sorry to cut you off. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. I'll just wrap up by saying on behalf of the Massachusetts chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, thank you for joining us here today and on Facebook. Um, we would love for you to get further involved. I know many of you are not from Massachusetts, maybe from the greater New England area, or even we had a couple of people register from the West Coast. So I'm gonna go ahead and post a couple of links for everyone. Um, that will be how to find your local AFSP chapter. We are a volunteer driven organization. So always looking for more supporters and volunteers to get, in get involved and support our mission to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. And of course, I can't leave without mentioning our upcoming Out of the Darkness Community Walks. We are excited to say that the majority of our walks across the nation will be in person um, to some level <laughs> this fall. So you can find your local walk and register. Um, and maybe we'll see you at the Boston Area Walk this year. We would love to have you as an honored guest. Great. Any further comments, Nancy, before we wrap up? No, great. Thanks to everyone who participated. And thanks for uh, helping us think more deeply about this work, Matt. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. <laughs>